morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you so much to the Creative Mornings team for inviting me. So we're supposed to start this session with an icebreaker question, which I've dedicated the task to the youngest in our family, Lima. Um, we all unanimously agree that she's a great public speaker. And I was actually very excited for her part, but more about my part. Uh, hello. I think someone else is trying to participate. Um, sorry, I just wanted to know what the icebreaker question was. Okay, so the icebreaker question was, if you meet someone and they're an absolute stranger to you, you don't know their circumstances, you don't know their background, what gift will you give them? What can you offer this person? Um, I think someone already said, but I would offer them a smile because I think a smile goes a long way. Smiles can start the most wonderful relationships and friendships. And that's how I've met some of the most greatest people in my life. So I think a smile is really important. That's a great answer. Thank you so much. Okay. So moving on. Now, just with that simple question, you've already actually achieved one of the key takeaways from today's session which is thinking about the other person, becoming more aware of those that are in our surroundings, of our environment, not just those who we already are familiar with, our loved ones, our close friends, but absolute strangers. To kick it off, Spectrum. In today's session, I'm looking at Spectrum from the diversity we have in our society, both globally and locally, the different identities, and how complex of a society that we all exist in, the different realities we're constantly sharing without even realizing it. Next, please. Specifically, I'll be looking at the spectrum from the inclusivity aspect. Today, I want to be able to teach you all about the value of inclusivity, the power of inclusivity, and the importance of inclusivity in ensuring better social cohesion and better tomorrow for us all. Now, working with the United Nations, whenever we talk about inclusivity, the very first thing that comes up is the leave no one behind concept. It might seem self-explanatory, but it's actually a really complex concept that takes a lot to understand and to actually implement. What does it really mean to leave no one behind? First of all, it means that we won't lump some people all together. We won't just say women. You, vulnerable groups. We have disaggregated data to really understand the different demographic groups that exist in society so that we can make more informed decisions, more inclusive policies. We need to understand everyone, not only understand them and be conscious of their existence in our society, but understand their different needs. What does she need that's different than what he needs? What does a widow need other than a single mom? 
What does someone with special needs need differently than a migrant? All of us in this society have different needs, and those needs need to be reflected in all of our industries, private sector, public sector, government, schools, everywhere. We need to have an inclusive society to ensure a peaceful world. Now, not to play devil's advocate, but you could say, why should I care? Why should this matter? Because it's true. Some people have in the past voiced out their opinion and said, why do I need to care about the minority when everything's going so well? Why do I have to consider that different group that probably has different values you disagree with? They don't come from your culture. So much when you think of the differences that we all share. I'm about to share some good news and some bad news. Just to show you that, yes, one person missing out from the equation influences us all, positively and negatively. Thinking of inequality, really what I'm trying to talk to you about right now is the vulnerable and most marginalized groups in our society. That could be anyone, orphans, immigrants, refugees, or even people who are just left behind. Now, the good news is that we've made some progress in this world. Between 2010 and 2019, we've been able to tackle extreme poverty rates and go from 15% to 8.2%. On a similar note, about 38 of the developing countries have improved their income inequality by one point. One point might not sound a lot, but it has changed lives. And then a lot of investment is going into research and development for us to build resilient industries that are sustainable. Why is this good? Why, why is it merging between all these differences? And, and think of it as minimizing the gap we have between us when it comes to inequality is good for us all. First of all, we're empowering our economy because we're realizing the different talents that everyone has to offer. Second of all, we are empowering youth and women because youth and women tend to be always the most vulnerable groups. And lastly, it's advancing engagement. Imagine this if you're in a society where no one is left behind and all of the differences we have is something to celebrate as an asset, not as an extra burden for us to think about. Because when it comes to creating policies and projects, if I have to think of a comprehensive list for everyone, first thing we notice is that that's such an extra layer of work. And that almost sounds impossible. But that layer of work, the extra additional one, will have some of the most long-term peace-building results. So why is it that if we just ignore it? We continue living our days. I mean, think of it. Majority of us in this room, we're doing fine. We're doing great. We're not the ones who are left behind. What will it hurt me if I continue living my good life and wishing the best for others, but not really taking proactive action to help in inequality? The bad news. Especially with COVID-19, the bad news are getting worse every day. Extreme poverty rate has increased for the very first time in over decades. And it's expected, it's, it's expected to jump up to 9% just in 2020. Imagine what will happen in 2021, then 2022, and 2023. The other situation is COVID-19 hits everyone hard, but 90% of those that have hurt were people living in informal settings and slums. Those who already struggle in getting basic health care day to day basis. Imagine during the pandemic. And lastly, is that when it came to food insecurity, already in 2019, we saw about 26% people globally struggle. What will 2021 and 2020 look like during the pandemic for people who already struggled in 2019? So, why is this so bad? First of all, there's more increase, probably, in violent extremism. And that's because most of those who were convicted of violent extremism have complained that they felt already left behind their community, neglected, they didn't have access to education, employment opportunities. They felt like they didn't have a chance from day one in making it into society. Second problem, 
is that there will be an increase of social polarization. The classes that we already exist in, the rich, the poor, the middle, it will now get even worse for all of us. The poor are getting poorer, and the rich might get richer, but that doesn't matter because what will happen is the lines of inequality will deepen to a crazy extent. Now, thinking of the spectrum, now that I've tried to give you the global spectrum of trying to see the good news and the bad news, I want to take it from more of a peace building angle. Next, please. So you might ask, let's make the situation better then. How can we do that? What does it look like globally when I'm talking about social cohesion? How do we create social cohesion between countries, let alone individuals? What can I do to make two countries start to get along better? Now, when it comes to the peace building work that we do, think of it from a more regional and cross-border initiative. A lot of these countries that neighbor each other already might struggle from a history of war, of war, a history of political differences, probably inter-ethnic tension, religious differences, the idea of us, them, us, the other. So a lot of the work we've done, which has been very interesting for me to learn and to share with you all today, is cross-border initiatives. Some of them was literally heading to the borders a lot of the violence erupts already between the towns and villages to get these people for the very first time to do exchange trips, exchange programs, having a chance for them to go ahead and for themselves experience the other culture. It might sound like a soft power tool, something super simple, but imagine if you're someone who doesn't even want to participate and is taking that first step. What we're really trying to do is change our perception change their behavior. That's the issue, is the way we perceive other people. And that's what we're trying to tackle. Another one of my favorites is the inter-ethnic dialogue. Dialogue, getting people to talk to each other, can sound simple again, but that is a long way. Getting them to listen to each other for the very first time. Some of them have never even wanted to be in the same room. Imagine putting them in the same room, getting them to realize that at the end of the day, what you need, what I need, is the same thing. We all know the basic necessities. That understanding bridges a lot of differences. And one of my other favorites is reviewing school curriculums. Because, whether we realize it or not, a lot of our teachings, a lot of the narrative we taught the future generation, how could we talk our children to discuss differences? How could we written about different cultures in our books, in our curriculums? So we review these school books to ensure that the language is as neutral as possible, is as objective as possible, and that we're already giving our children a global mindset, not a bias one. But a real big thing I want to share with you today is that inclusivity is not the same thing as accessibility. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with accessible services, right? How can we increase accessibility? That's a big thing. And no better time than now to give you an example of what's happening with the pandemic, something huge I've learned and a lot of other people have to. Technology saved us, right, when it came to surviving the pandemic, being quarantined, working from home. It was super adaptive. But is technology inclusive? Do you realize how many people still don't own laptops and phones and have to share them with their siblings and parents? Some people don't even have access to Wi Fi. So take a step back to realize that as we are designing solutions every day, I'm being inclusive. Accessibility is wonderful, but what does it really mean? The service isn't even inclusive to the first place for everyone. Next, please. Now, I want to zoom in different. So I told you about the global spectrum, but what about looking a bit narrow? What can governments really do then to increase inclusivity? I'll give you three ways, and they're some of my favorites that have been shown to succeed by research and by previous projects. Number one, national surveys. National surveys help governments understand a comprehensive list of the demographics in their society. All the different groups. Again, the segregated data is super important because that will help the government then lead on to create an inclusive policy that represents all the different needs they have in society. 
don't just represent identity, you want to represent the needs that they have. Another way through it is funds, investment funds, specified for those vulnerable and marginalized groups. To give you a few examples, having a fund for entrepreneurs with special needs, they probably have a lot to offer to society and they're already struggling, unlike the average person. Let's help them bridge the gap. Let's help them reach the same level that everyone else exists on. One of the ways is to invest in them, whether financially, whether they're building their capacity, whatever way. Another popular example of seeing more of the Middle East is special funds dedicated to women in rural areas to start their own businesses. The third way a government can help in inclusivity is, and this is, a, this is another one that thinking of Saudi 2030 vision, right? Countries have strategies, visions, national plans. But what if we have them specified as rather than industries, but at that part line the vulnerable group? A special strategy to focus on women, at orphans, at single moms, single dads, focusing on them, but not just any vision. Let's make it time bound. Say by 2025, we will reach 50% of women will be in leadership positions in the private sector. It might sound a bit of a dream, but why not? Why is this important? recommended group, we've given it time, we've chosen the industry, we've really committed. We haven't just made an abstract generalized goal. And if governments do so, they're helping shaping everyone's narrative now about this vulnerable group. They're helping businesses, they're helping us all have a vision. What can businesses then do to improve inclusivity internally? Create more social cohesion for their own employees. Now, number one, it always starts with recruitment. The type of people you're recruiting in your office is super essential. But not just what type of people. Take a second, look at your office, and think who's not here? Who's not an employee in this company? And why so? Who's missing? Who's being left behind in these opportunities? And it comes to recruitment, hire a diversity and inclusion consultant. To help you in the recruitment process. And hire that consultant also to look at all your policies. Are they inclusive? Is the widow in your office, the single mom, the single dad, the single girl, are they all represented in your policy? Do your people in your office reflect in your policies? Going back to recruitment, I would say, and research again has shown that recruiting people in senior levels and junior levels is the most essential. Mid level, yes, please. Can recruit through all levels, but really where it matters is senior and junior. Why? If you're at a senior level and you're from a diversity group, then that will trickle down to the philosophy of the company. Just because of the leadership position you have in decision making and influencing others. If you're at a junior level, you're already making a huge investment in this, in this vulnerable or this minority ethnic person future, and you're giving them already something as a stepping stone to the next job. So you're investing already in the next future. Another thing that, com com um, that um, companies can do is carving out the space to talk about diversity and inclusion. When I say carving out the space, I mean make it mandatory. Don't make it something voluntary. In one of the companies I used to work in, we have to, every three to six months, sit down beside each other on the table, all the staff, we had to sign it off, even if we didn't get our performance done. Then we had to discuss sensitive topics, such as how do you struggle with racism in your day-to-day -day job? How can you improve gender equality in the office? I cannot tell you how much I got to know my colleagues through those conversations, more than the day-to-day -day tasks that we do. And that's because we're so busy doing our job, we never get the chance to hear each other out. So carve out that space for your employees. Don't just assume social cohesion exists because we're all getting along anyways. Next slide. So this is the most important slide. What can you do? Let's give you the spectrum on an individual level. You're not a government, you're not a business, you're thinking, well, Jude, I'm just a little person, really. What can I do with this global big issue? You're telling me that globally, these all big percentages, what can I do? There's a lot you can do. As a society, we've been raised to believe in doing good, kindness to others, right? 
And just a little bit of research the next time you want to do any act of charity. Who in your society is being left behind? Who in your society do you notice? Lack access to opportunities that you can have. Maybe don't even look far, look at your own family, look at your own cousins. Let's not pretend that we even share the same reality with our siblings, with our cousins. Some of us have more opportunities than others. And then think, what can I do for this person? I'll give you a nice example. There's a lawyer I once worked with in London, and she was a wonderful, top shot lawyer. And then one time she heard that she actually came from a very difficult neighborhood. And she often goes back to that neighborhood because there's a state school there. And on a pro bono basis, she offered to review all the students' applications for college because that school is, has a low, low rate of anyone even applying. Those students don't even think they'll make it in the first place. But when they heard that the city firm lawyer is going to review our applications, guess what? They got motivated. They thought, maybe I'll have a chance. This is exciting. And she used her weekends, her own voluntary time, to make that investment. The school told her that that was the most year they've ever seen college applications be sent out. And she's continued to do it. And actually, by this point, I think she even made a mini side hustle from it because of how much she enjoyed it. So you don't have to go crazy and do something big. Literally look at your neighborhood, look what around you, think, what can I offer? What are they struggling with that maybe I can do something about? Now, to make it a bit more interesting, I want you to think also, how can I have an inclusive mindset? It's not just the actions you do, but your mindset, the way you perceive differences is really also important. Whether we want to admit it or not, we all have unconscious biases, prejudice on other people, beliefs, assumptions about the other. So here's just a few steps. I will say that it's not a sure deal, but if you try your best, then at least you're a step ahead today than you were yesterday. First of all, check your biases. Ask yourself, what do I think about other groups? What is it that I know is a pattern of me when I discuss certain cultures, certain genders, certain identities? What does my vocabulary sound like? Also think, did I once have a bad experience with a certain culture and now I'm projecting it yet again on others? Do I have a stereotype? Once you check yourself, accept that yes, we all have an unconscious bias. You can't fix what you don't accept. And then challenge yourself. Is this true? Is what I'm thinking real? Is my belief that that certain group is bad or that person, individual, and me can't align with our values and our thinking and are absolutely different and they can't be an asset to find? Is this true? Is it a fact or is it an assumption? And then my favorite part is commit to change. Now, I'll give you a fun little exercise that someone gave me once, and by this point, I think I've done it far too many times. But the next networking event you go to, sit with someone you would never sit with. Someone outside of your friend zone, outside of your comfort zone, get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Find one individual in the room that probably you'd never be caught having coffee with. Go ahead, talk to them, speak with them. I can't promise it'll be a great experience or a bad experience, but I can promise you this, you'll know something about this individual you didn't know 10, 5 minutes ago. And that's what I mean by bridging our differences. And then make that a fun activity. Look at your friends. Do all your friends sound alike? Who are you missing when it comes to your friends? On a final note, COVID-19 has been a challenge, but I cannot emphasize how bad news are still keep coming. Inequality lines have deepened more than ever right now. We're expecting to see more conflict, inter-ethnic tension, and issues with trust building in every community. The other become more of a concept. You'll hear these kind of things. People are stealing our jobs. This is this person doesn't really belong here. This is not our culture. This is not our life. And whenever you catch these kind of phrases, become a champion for the cause of inclusivity. Be brave enough to say, but is that so? Do we need to think this? Challenge everyone around you, parents, siblings, friends, employees, champion this cause of your day to day life. Because it, will, because it will go a long, long way. 
And maybe, just maybe, we can reach that idealistic dream of a peaceful world where inclusion is a priority. And I'd like to leave you all with this. Let's try not to leave anyone behind. It's a collective action that requires all of us, not just the industries, not just the seniors, not just the, the decision makers, it requires you as well. So, after this lovely morning having spent it here, I want you all to think, how will you, moving forward, try to improve inclusion in your own community? Thank you very much. <laughs>